Well, welcome everybody. It's, it's lovely to see you joining us. Um, I'm Anna Middleton, Head of Society and Ethics Research at the Wellcome Genome Campus in Connecting Science. Um, and I'm going to be giving a pre-recorded presentation that we did yesterday um, around setting the scene for um, the Your DNA, Your Say study, which has been an incredible piece of work, really because of the collaborative nature of it and all the collaborators that are involved with it. So when we had the idea of doing the seminar, um, the original plan was it, that we would just give a backdrop to the, pro the project for all the collaborators. And then we thought, well, why not just open it up so that anybody can enjoy um, taking part and, and listening to what the project is about. So. We are actually going to be running a series of seminars over, well, the rest of this year, um, where we'll go into depth about the results from the project. We'll hear from different collaborators about their experiences um, from their perspectives of taking part in the study and their data um, and what their public attitudes um, results are showing. Um, but this particular seminar is really just introducing and giving an overview for everybody about what we've been doing and why. Um, and how the project evolved. So we wanted to um, uh, also celebrate that one of a, a really big paper from the project um, came out yesterday that the collaborators are all involved with. And I'm hoping that um, Lauren will pop that into the chat. So those of you on the call, if you've not seen the paper, um, this is led by Richard and it's on uh, trustworthiness and trust across um, 22 countries public audiences saying what they value in terms of trustworthy science. Um, so have, have a look at that paper. It's really exciting. It really summarizes a lot of what we've been doing. OK, so we're going to hope that the Zoom allows us, but I'm going to ask Lauren if she could share her screen and we're going to play the pre-recorded presentation and then I'll come back um, into the Zoom um, once that's finished, then we'll open up everything for questions. Welcome to this presentation. I'm going to give you an overview of the Your DNA, Your Say study, which is a global public survey that's gathered the views of 37,000 people from 22 countries, data gathered in 16 different languages. Um, and this presentation really is going to cover how the project evolved. It started incredibly small and has ended up incredibly large. Um, and so I wanted to share with you the history of, of the work and really wanted to celebrate the power of social scientists across the world um, who came together for this piece of research and really delivered something on quite a large scale. Um, before I launch into the background to the study, I really want to set the scene. Um, so in any research, normally what you would do is uh, write a project proposal, write a grant, get funding, um, cost everything out properly and then do the research. And that's absolutely the opposite of what we did with this piece of research. It um, hasn't been formally funded. And um, I'm so grateful to the different funders who over the years have been so generous with uh, finding little pockets of cash to support this work, whether it's for the recruitment or whether it's for making the films that sit within the study. Um, and so I wanted to acknowledge those people. So Audrey Duncanson from Welcome um, funded the films that we use in our study. Um, and Julia Wilson has been so incredibly supportive from the Sanger Institute. So she helped support also the filmmaking and also the recruitment. Um, and this is a piece of work for the Global Alliance for Genomics and Health and Peter Goodhand um, and Bartha Canopas also incredibly supportive and found money from GA4GH to support the work. Um, and uh, last but not least, Welcome Connecting Science. So that's where I work as Head of Society and Ethics Research um, with a, an amazing team um, of social scientists, psychologists, um, filmmakers, administrators, anthropologists, um, collectively um, supporting this work. And so my boss, Julian Rayner has been really enabled that to happen from, from within Welcome Connecting Science. Um, okay, so the, the, this project came out of a meeting several years ago at the Global Alliance for Genomics and Health. So GA4GH is an international nonprofit organization formed in 2013 
Um, and its whole mission is to advance genomic medicine and research um, by enabling data sharing to happen. Um, and I'm part of the Regulatory and Ethics Working Group, as it was called then. And I was part of a call um, several years ago where we were looking and thinking about um, regulation and policy around genomic data sharing. And I said something like, um, well, where is the public or the patient voice in this? And I, and I said, you know, would it be worth doing a public survey to, to try and get some data, some empirical data uh, from a public voice that we can use in the policy that the GA4GH um, are writing? And so that was thought to be um, a, a good idea. And at the time I was running um, a social sciences research project for the Sanger Institute, looking at what to do with incidental findings from sequencing research. So I thought, well, this, is, this can't be difficult you know, creating a survey. Um, and that sort of started uh, uh, the establishment of the Participant Values Task Team, which was the first group that really started to think around what could we do in terms of, of gathering and involving public attitudes. And I'll come back to that task team in, in a few slides time. But what we were thinking around about really was, um, the, the people behind the data that sits in data sets that's used around the world in research and health healthcare. So if this little girl um, came to a genetics clinic um, and had a DNA sample taken um, to try and work out whether there was a, a genetic um, reason for her diagnosis or a diagnostic reason. So her data would be compared um, by the clinical scientists to large data sets of existing um, data from other people. Um, so, and those data sets contain um, information, DNA and medical information from hundreds of thousands of other people. And those people need to be of different ages, um, uh, some well, some ill, different ethnic backgrounds. Um, and, and the reason we need these enormous data sets is to um, make sure that we understand what the variant means in this little girl. Is it going to play, you know, is it causative of her condition? Is it predictive of disease? Uh, so it could be this little girl we're looking at. It could be um, this father and son. It could be this man at the bottom of the screen. Um, but the, the whole aim of, of the comparison of the data is to try and figure out how have um, different gene faults played out in other people and that's how you know that's how we we um, do genomic um, interpretation but the people in the crowd here so if they if they represent the data sets um, we need lots of them and we need lots of different uh, data sets from around the world um, and there's a real push at the moment for diversity of data. So we know that uh, most of the data sets that we have come from people of Northern European descent. And so there are big calls for making the data sets more diverse. Now, why should public audiences care about any of this? And I think it's reasonable to say that most public audiences around the world currently don't really care because they don't really know why this is even relevant to them. And the reason that they may feel it could be relevant to them is because there's so much data that has been collected around the world that there is enough out there to connect most of us to each other. So even if we're not personally having any level of testing ourselves, we're not engaging with genomic medicine, we're not engaging with research, we're not having uh, donating blood and ticking the form at the bottom of the consent form that says we're happy to participate in research and our data ends up in large data sets. If we're not doing any of those things, we will still be biologically related, even distantly to somebody who is. Um, so it means that all of us now um, should have a, um, a sense of what's going on because it's relevant to all of us. So we should have a voice in policy. And the whole point of you know, enabling data sharing to happen um, to advanced human health is because, you know, we will all benefit from the outputs of this in terms of understanding the links between genes, disease and environment and genetics and data sharing is just at the heart of that. And, you know, all of us will benefit from the advancing healthcare that comes out of this. 
Um, and if certain groups of society aren't involved, then the healthcare that they will get in terms of genomic medicine may not be as good as for other groups that are more represented. And we know that the development of genomic and personalized medicine relies on the collective willingness of people to allow data about themselves to be produced and shared. So it's, it's really, we're at a tipping point in society where we need to be collectively deciding, are we in or are we out with this? And are we feeling okay about it? And if we're not, what needs to change? And what systems and governance structures need to be in place so that we feel comfortable about it. And if we're not happy, then what is it that we're not happy with? And we need to have, be able to express that. And we know, you know, that not everybody is feeling comfortable about science more broadly, but also genetics specifically. And there's a whole world of, you know, different histories and relationships between science and genetics in society. Um, certain, particular communities feeling discriminated against, feeling that genetics has not served them historically, have different relationships with health services, with commercial companies, with nonprofit organizations, feeling a sense of disquiet about the way science and society um, are, are mixing and whether you know people actually feel served or not is a very, very valid point. And, those social scientists who've been working in this space for a long time are very familiar with the disquiet that many um, particular groups feel about, about genetics. Um, and how do we bring them on board? Well, the first sort of way to do that um, is to start conversations and to see what the starting point is in terms of attitudes and values and beliefs and behaviors around this whole space. Um, and so coming back to the GA4GH, we set up the Participant Values Task Team, and here are the names of the first people that were on that group. Um, and we started having phone calls. So this is going back to probably around 2015. And I, you know, this is before we were all doing Zoom calls. And I remember having um, many uh, telephone calls where lines were glitchy and you know, we couldn't hear everybody and there was a slight time delay and we were trying to agree what should the format be for this research that we knew we wanted to do and how would we construct it and uh, what's the best way of delivering it. Um, and I was so lucky that Heidi Howard and Amelia Nemich decided to come and spend a month with me in Cambridge so that we could really um, thoroughly investigate how to construct a survey that um, would adequately tackle some of the issues that we wanted to explore in terms of attitudes towards genomics and, and data sharing. Um, so here's Heidi and Amelia, and um, we, we spent time really thinking about the wording in the survey um, and whether it was me adequately measuring the constructs that we were interested in. And we kept checking in with the participant values task team um, we did all the piloting together, we did all the user testing together, um, and we decided that we wanted to use film in the surveys um, as a way of building a bridge to public audiences because we knew, you know, empirically through the research that we'd already done individually that um, many public audiences were very disconnected from the science and didn't know why it would even be relevant for them. So we wanted to cut through that by um, explaining the backdrop to genomic data sharing using little Charlie here um, in the survey. Um, and so we wrote the scripts for the uh, a series of films and we brought in filmmaker Tim Pope to make these films. Um, we also knew that the films would translate well for some groups and not so well for others. And we knew that would be a bit of a compromise. <clears throat> so for example, when we were talking with our um, Russian collaborators later we realized that explaining genetics through the eyes of a child um, didn't really fit so well societally, um, you know, wouldn't be received quite so well, whereas for our Japanese collaborators we knew, uh, well we had feedback that explaining genetics through the eyes of, ch of a child was very relatable and, and people like that. Um, so we know that this sort of worked for some, but maybe not for others, but it was the method that we had for trying to get um, information about genomics and data sharing out. And I wanted to sort of at this point also mention that 
quite a lot of coding. Um, and, well, obviously, a lot of coding would go into the creation of the survey because it was a bespoke survey that our web team um, put together. So Paul and James and Claire worked so hard on getting the coding right, but also getting the look and the feel right so that it flowed you know, well for a user experience. And then when we started to bring the translations in, um, you know, and none of us are speaking these other languages, you know, really, really complicated for the web team to know when the survey is working, you know, correctly when we don't actually, we're not native speakers of the languages that the survey was translated into. Anyway, when Heidi and Amelia and myself were writing the questions for the survey, um, Heidi is multilingual um, and as a French Canadian, she knew that she would be translating her version of the survey into to French and she knew that she this had to make sense for people who were from France who spoke French and also people who were from Canada who spoke French and also the French speaking Belgians as well so there was a lot of thought that went into the construction of each sentence in French and whether it would speak to the different audiences and um, Amelia did the Polish translation and so we started off with these three languages English, Polish and French and then from there it really snowballed. So um, here are our collaborators around the world. Not everybody's on this map, but it just gives you a, a broad view of, of most of the collaborators that we ended up having. And the, the way they came on board was so fantastic. It, it was really just through this iterative enthusiasm for the work. So I would go, you know, be invited to conferences. So I did a um, quite a few uh, talks at one time in South Africa um, and Australia and various other countries. Oh, Osaka, Japan. And I'd, I'd speak to the audience about the study and say we had, you know, translations going. And does anybody want to help and take part and translate into your own languages? And just the enthusiasm was amazing. Um, and, you know, I remember meeting Haytham, who did our Arabic translations. Uh, in the dining room of a conference in Osaka and he said yes I can do the Arabic translation for, for you and then that's how that collaboration was set up um, and it just sort of grew and grew and bearing in mind that none of these collaborators are paid to work on the project they've just done this through a passion for the topic um, and a willingness and openness to be part of this incredible project and it's really them that have made this project what it is um, and I'm just so grateful that they were willing to come on this, this journey with us. Um, and so here we have the survey translated into Hindustani, um, Arabic and Japanese. And as I mentioned, we've got 16 languages in total. Um, and in the data that we've gathered, this isn't even the final data set. We're still going. So um, our, our partner from Ghana, so our PhD student, Jerome Atitornu, who's doing translations into Ua and Tri, um, to Ghanaian languages, that will, um, the recruitment into that arm of the study will be happening this year. Um, so it's just still evolving, data is still coming in. Um, and yeah, so we gathered data in all these different countries, 37,000 people so far have filled it, it in. Um, and one of the key aspects I think is as to why it's, you know, had a real traction is, is the films in it. Um, and so I just wanted to um, show you a couple of screenshots from the films and also show you a summary of the films. So we've pieced together, so Lauren, our senior manager in, in my group, um, who's also a filmmaker, has pieced together um, three of the different films in showing the 16 different languages. Um, and I'm going to show you that now. There's a lot of personal stuff about us online. Ah, my school photo. I can see my maths results here. And here's my family tree. Medical information can also be online. Doctors save symptoms on the computer. It's all stored securely. DNA information can be online too. DNA can tell us about our health. This person's DNA, found in her saliva, is very similar to her relatives. 
Does that make it special? Here's all the information we need to collate. Time to put it somewhere safe. And if these shelves are inside a computer, this is where I'd keep them. The information is all electronic. Some databases are public and available to anyone. Some databases need authorization and a key. What if your DNA and medical information was in an online database? Hi, I'm a medical doctor. I'm a scientist and I represent a pharmaceutical company. Any of us may need to access the DNA and medical information in the database. But none of us know who the information belongs to because all names have been removed. As you can see, some contain the information we need. It's like collecting pieces of a jigsaw. And some we cannot open because we do not have the right key from the gatekeeper. Would you like to see a readout of your DNA information? Databases are accessed via the web. DNA and medical information are accessed every second. What happens when all your personal information is linked together? DNA and medical information for an anonymous patient is contained in a scientific paper from Cambridge. The DNA from this patient is very unusual. I wonder how hard it could be to work out who it's from. Starting with a location and a bit of unusual medical information. Time to do some rummaging. Right, let's look at rare heart conditions in Cambridge. Ah, this looks relevant. If we find details of a rare medical condition on a public website, you might see the same wording for this condition in an anonymous scientific publication. If there is a name on the public site, then you could assume the scientific publication is about the same person. Hmm, could this be our person? It looks like I've found her. It's pretty easy to piece together different bits of personal information, deliberately or even by accident. If their DNA and medical information is part of this picture, what harm could it do? OK, so the films build the bridge. The questions are around genomic data sharing and here broadly uh, are what the results are showing. I'm not going to go into the results in any great depth because we're having a series of seminars and that's where the depth of the results will be discussed in much more detail. But just to give you a very, very broad overview um, across the different countries, and of course there's variation between countries, but the broad messages that have come out um, in the first big papers that we've published from this work is that broadly across the world, representative public audiences are largely unfamiliar with what DNA genetics and genomics is all about and the whole endeavor of, of data sharing. So there, there really is a lack of familiarity and awareness with what we're doing with it in the genomics industry. Um, we also know that broadly, again, variation between countries, but across all of them together, um, over half are really unwilling to donate their data, their DNA and health data for use by several people. So they, they like the idea in principle, some of them donating their data if their doctor asks for it, it's their own personal uh, physician but are less keen on the concepts of their data than being shared with others for genomic medicine or for genetic research. And we also know that less than half of the whole sample trust multiple users with their DNA and health information, so trust is low. And also the biggest factor that affects ability to trust is knowing who will benefit from their data. So they really want to understand what happens to data. They want to know who specifically will be using it and for what purposes. Um, and I think until we really address that and uh, really explain well why we need to do this um, and what genomic medicine is all about, 
Um, why genomic research is happening. We're not going to actually get people on board with this. So we have quite a big task ahead of us in really socialising this for people. So here's just a, a snapshot of a few of the papers that we've published in this area, um, and there are many more to come, but this just gives you a sense of the scale and the scope of the data coming out of this work. The raw data from the surveys is on our website, um, so Connecting Science, um, Society and Ethics Research website. So it's now available for anybody to play with, use, download, explore, um, and see you know, what the patterns are. Um, this is also, this study has really got me thinking about the existing communications and public engagement strategies that we have. So for those um, organisations that are fortunate enough to have budget for communications and public engagement, and there's a big policy call out across the world saying that we need to be doing this. Um, it really shows me that those strat existing strategies really reach people who are already engaged. So they reach people who have voted with their feet to actually read a newspaper article or come to an engagement event or um, watch a film about genomics and haven't um, disconnected before the messages have even got through. So it really makes me realize that we have got to do so more to figure out how to connect with people um, who really don't understand what any of this is about, very unfamiliar, and, and why should they be really? Um, we should be thinking of creative um, and innovative ways that you know we can actually connect with people with very, with very simple messaging around this. Um, and so one of the outcome messages from all of this research is that there really is an urgent need to genuinely socialize genomics for disengaged public audiences because if we don't um, you know, this is all happening and we're not going to be bringing them with us and we need to be able to do that. We need to be able to open the conversation up about this because it's happening. Data is bouncing around the Internet every second of the day being shared between nonprofit, for profit industries um, within healthcare. And, you know, we have a duty to society to bring them on, on this journey with us um, so that they can make choices about whether they're involved or not, and also can have a say in governance around this whole space. So that's where I'd like to end in just summarizing the backdrop to this, this study. And in future seminars, we'll be exploring some of the actual outcomes and results from the, from the work. Thank you. And this is um, our team uh, at the Society and Ethics Research Group. And so Kate, has done the statistics, Lauren's done some incredible film work and infographics uh, for the project, Richard's done um, amazing analysis, um, Jerome's um, going to be recruiting in Ghana, John's always supportive, Chris too is also supportive, all of us have been very heavily involved um, in the project, we've also got Alessia who's not in the photo, um, Emma and Angela as well, and it's just to sort of show you that this project started out of just an idea and it's now grown into um, you know, something really big and exciting with lots of contributions from loads of incredible people around the world. And this is my final slide, just giving an idea of some of the, the names of people who've been involved over the years. Thank you. Right, um, hopefully that gave you a, a nice little overview of the backdrop to the study is, as I mentioned in the pre-recording, we're going to open this up to a series of seminars over the coming months so that, you know, we can explore in more depth the actual data because there's enough papers for the next 20 years. Um, so I'd like to open this up. I, Richard um, is behind the scenes and was hopefully going to be gathering any questions if there were any questions. I've not kept a, an eye on the chat, so I don't know, Richard, if there are any questions. Um, we haven't had any yet, but I would uh, encourage people to either yeah, put, um, put their hand up if, if you're if you can, or just drop things in the Q and A um, as well, and I'll try and collate those. Um, but Fantastic. yeah, I mean, um, from my end, Anna, I want to say yeah, thanks so much for the talk, and thanks for involving me in in the project. I've been signed up for just over two years, and it's been it's been absolutely fantastic to meet all of the. Uh, the team of people who've been working on this project and to be involved in it is incredibly exciting. It's, it's lovely. I mean, the thing is that, yeah, Richard came in at, I guess, quite late because we'd already got the data in. 
but also managed to save me from myself in terms of <laughs> helping us to make sense of it. You know, there's so much, isn't there, in this? Um, and so Richard's played an absolutely pivotal role in helping to, um, you know, prioritise what we want to publish and pulling things together. Um, so it's been it's been a fa fantastic project because I've been overseeing it and it's just grown and grown and grown and grown. And we just have incredible players throughout um, to, to, to draw it all together. Uh, we do just have, so Haitam has just asked whether the recording will be uploaded to the website, and I think, yes, it's, it's going to be on the Society and Ethics Research website and all of the papers and everything else that, from the paper are all accessible through through the website. So, um, yeah, it will be available to watch again and again and again. Um, I suppose... Oh, no, Lauren's just put in that, yeah, so there's our uh, website details. And Lauren, would you be able to pop in, I don't know if you already did, um, the details of the latest paper that came out yesterday? on trustworthiness, that would be amazing. Richard, do you want to say anything about Welcome Open Research and this being a home for, for papers moving forward? Yeah, absolutely. So we've, um, yeah, so so we have been in touch with Welcome Open Research, which is um, Welcome Welcome's um, publishing platform. Um, and with a view to thinking about where the home is. So we have this, this data across all these countries and we have the kind of meta-analysis papers looking across kind of comparative, but we're also really interested in getting the analyses of kind of individual companies or small groups of companies that allow us the space to kind of talk in a bit more detail about what's actually going on in terms of the development of genomic medicine, the context for data collection and sharing in, the, in those countries. And so, um, yeah, so if I think yeah, if you're interested in, in working with the data from um, a specific country and looking for a home for that, then do yeah, get in touch and um, because yeah, Welcome Open Research is really, um, yeah, a really good place to, to work to go from that, go for that. I wanted to say something um, actually that I didn't um, emphasize and that that is who are the disconnected and disengaged audiences and and um actually putting a figure on that is is really tricky because the people who tend to take part in research will often vote with their feet to actually take part in the research to give their attitudes so it's actually very hard um getting through some of the barriers to even reach disengaged audiences to ask them more about you know why they're disengaged um, and I just wanted to highlight um, some work that came out of the British Science Association um, looking at audience segments um, and they concluded so they did some work with with King's College London um, that it's probably around 70 percent ish of the British public don't care have no intention of engaging um, with scientific topics so they may be vaguely interested but they're not actively putting themselves forward or they actually really don't care they have many other things going on in their lives so it's it's probably the majority of, of if we think about cross public audiences who um, actively turn away when they see opportunities to engage about something so they see a news headline in an article um, about incredible Sanger research or you know covid variants or whatever and they actively switch off when they see that um, so how do we reach them? Because they are in the majority and um, telling them stuff is not the way in um, because we, we know that that's not work. And it's, that's a really, really big challenge for everybody working within the engagement spectrum. Um, I can see there's a question just coming. Yeah, there's a couple of questions coming in. And also, um, if you've got your hand up, I can't actually unmute. So if you could just type your question into the chat as well, if you've got your hands up. Um, thanks. Um, so yeah, so Anna, there's a question here that's, um, yeah, what's your sense of this research, um, from this research of the findings being reflected back into and shaping the genomics research or medical settings, so particularly people's stances on data sharing? Yeah, so, so obviously step one is, is doing the research to start with, and, and, and that isn't the end of the journey by any stretch of the imagination, so what we need to do, all of us, is to be um, disseminating this as much as we possibly can and feeding it back to science, the genomics industry and um, policy makers. So we did this particular piece of research for the GA4GH um, and Richard and I and also many of the collaborators 
um, in the group are part of the Global Alliance for Genomics and Health, and we are actively involved in contributing to policy that the GA4GH puts out. So that organization, which represents 600, more than 600 organizations around the world. So the, the main key players in the genomic medicine world and the, and the genomic data, biodata world are part of that um, organization, feed into its discussion and debates, go to its conferences, are part of the policy making. So, so a big part of what we're doing is um, to feed back into that policy. And we're written into the strategic roadmap for the GA4GH. So there's a commitment to hear what we're saying as well and to take that on board. But that's really where we're gonna be focusing next is getting the data out um, and then getting it back into the system so that it can actually affect change. That's, that has to be part of what we're doing. Thanks. And there's another question here about whether you, um, whether you think that people's worries about sharing their DNA data are justified. Um, are they justified as in, um, no, we are honest brokers and they don't need to worry? Um, well, of course, <laughs> of course, the genomics industry wants to be honest brokers and is trustworthy. I mean, part of the challenge is, is um, being worthy of trust and also being able to communicate why one is trustworthy. Do, do I think that the, the concerns are real and valid? Absolutely, they're real and valid. Um, and you know, we can't overpromise. I mean, of course our intent is good. Of course we're doing, you know, the genomic research for the good of others. Of course that is the intent, but no security system is ever 100% secure. We can't overpromise on that. And of course the intent is that we'll all do our best that there, you know, to ensure that there won't be data breaches and that there won't be malicious hacking and that people won't be identified from their data, but we can't, promise that with 100% absolute guarantee and if and people get that I think if we promise it then it's over promising and then people won't trust us um, because they're mistrusting to start with I think this is about showing humility and humbleness and saying you know we're doing our best to do a good enough job be with us come with us on this journey talk to us about what your fears are and how we together we can make systems as secure as possible um, but we can't overpromise on that. And I know there's lots of discussion about blockchain and there's lots of discussion about, you know, creating APIs that are secure and, you know, um, yes, fantastic. We should be making our systems as more secure than the best banking systems in the world. But I think we're overpromising that if we can, if we say we guarantee it. I think there's a, there's a, there's a related question here about the, um, I think about the distinction between um, yeah, saying that you can trust us and then talking about being trustworthy. Um, and it's the, the question is, um, how do you see industry receiving the challenge between, uh, distinct, distinguishing between uh, trust us, but we're not actually trustworthy or, yeah, or saying trust us, but we're not going to trust you. So how do, the kind of, yeah, how do you ensure that people are? Yeah. Um, and, you know, do you need to trust a system in order to be able to use it? I don't know that I particularly trust MasterCard, but yeah, I need to use MasterCard. Um, and actually, do you know what? I'm going to turn this back to you, Richard, because I know this is something you've been deeply thinking about um, and put you on the spot with that, because trustworthiness is about being able to authentically communicate that you're worthy of trust. And do you want to make some reference to that and also the paper that's just come out? Yeah, I mean, I, well, I suppose, yes, the main thing would be I would encourage you to go and um, read the paper that came out yesterday um, in which we asked people um, what yeah, we, we look at the question about what what would in, help enable people to trust the people um, responsible for managing and um, sharing and, and keeping their data, keeping data about them secure. Um, and the things that come out at the top of that list are um, yeah, trust being kind of being clear about what who's going to benefit. Um, who being clear about who's going to who's going to who's using the data, having the option to take your data out or data about you out if you um, if you feel the need, and then being kind of transparent about people's motives in in using the data. What is it that the data users are actually kind of gaining? So at times it might be quite clear. At other times, it might need spelling out more. And I think that this general shift from trust and trustworthy to trust trustworthiness is really important. I mean, I. 
I think we're both often in these kind of conversations where, you know, how do we, where people are asking kind of how do we increase public trust or how do we ensure public trust? And actually, ultimately there's very little, I mean, public trust, um, I think if you kind of conceptualize public trust as something that has kind of levers that you can pull, I, I don't think it's going to get you very far, but what you can do as an institution, whether that's a banking institution, a genomics institution, or, or any, any organization is to ensure that you are trustworthy and that you are seen to be trustworthy and that that's the that's the yeah probably the best way of building of building trust yeah and we also asked people in the your dna you'll say survey what does trust look like to you um and you know when we write our participant information sheets and consent forms and we write about you know i'm just talking generally in genomics research we write about what we're doing and why we often say things like well if you take part in this research um, then you will be contributing to improving our understanding of cancer or malaria or whatever. So there's this sort of very wide kind of output. You will be contributing to humankind in some way. But what we found in this research was that that wasn't enough for people. They actually want to know you specifically, you that's asking for my data, how will you benefit so will you get more funding for your research? Will you get more grants? Will you get your names on papers, your name on papers? Um, will you get a diagnosis um, for your patient? You know, how will you personally benefit? Um, and I think that takes it back to the individual person asking for data to actually justify, well, what, what's, what's my part in this? And this is all about the social contract and the social license. This is about being honest on both sides I take data from you, what do you get back in return? And people weighing up, what's the deal? What's the deal here? I mean, we're talking about this in lay terms. Um, what's, what, what is the partnership or is this one-sided? Um, and I think if we start to reframe how, why we're motivated to be doing research in this space individ as individuals, I think that would be incredibly helpful. And also to acknowledge that, you know, we. we public audiences and also us ourselves working in non-profit organizations, we, we very glibly sort of say, well, you know, for-profit companies make money for shareholders. So they're different actors in this space. And we sort of try to absolve ourselves of having personal benefit. Um, but actually we do, we do all have personal benefit in being part of this, you know, in terms of advancement of our careers or whatever. And I think we do need to be honest about that. And that's what public audiences are after is honesty and transparency. What will you do with my data? Where will it go? Can I withdraw it? The issue of being able to withdraw it is of course very uh, relevant to genomic research because it's really difficult to withdraw it, you know, after it's been shared when it's been de-identified and share on, shared on, it's almost impossible to withdraw it. Being explicit about that um, is, is absolutely paramount. Um, and so not saying, oh yes, you can withdraw from this without actually being able to do it in reality uh, and at what point you can withdraw. Um, so this is all about really, you know, treating people respectfully and giving them as much information as we have um, and delivering it to to them in a way that they can understand and have a think about and then make an informed choice about whether they they're a part of it or not so richard was there anything else um, um, so there's just one more comment here which um, uh, it's, uh, it's it's not so much a uh, question as a comment i think but it's the um uh, about the the value of hopefully meeting up in the future to talk about um, yeah, the project as a whole, and particularly, I think the questions around translation and, and that, that issue of uh, talking about DNA and data across languages, across cultures. I think, um, and I suppose I think there is a bit, there is a kind of a question in there in terms of like for you, what have been the the learnings, I suppose, around the kind of best practice in how you in how you assemble this kind of network of people working on a similar topic, and what and what sustains that. Um, Oh, I love that. I mean, that sort of implies that there was a systematic way of doing it. And actually, <laughs> there wasn't. This has all been about being very open and honest and um, just saying, you know, we're doing this work. We, we would love it if people could join us and being very, um, I don't know, humble in that. You know, I've, be, I've just been so fascinated to to welcome our collaborators, you know, from Japan and from Russia and from China and, you know, Costa Rica and, you know, across the world. It's just been so amazing to think about more holistically about how you actually translate even the technical terms that have no literal translation 
um, is really, really humbling because I think in the Western world, we just assume that you say the word DNA and gene and, and even genomics, but we know that most people haven't heard of genomics, but, it, but the concepts around this, we think that they translate and they really don't. Um, we think people are going to come to the questions about this in terms of public audiences with an open mind, and they're really not. You know, there's whole swathes of society across the world who've had a really, really tricky time with science more broadly, genetics specifically, um, are dealing with many other issues in their lives that they are very disconnected from this. And it's been such a learning journey, you know, even just starting with the translations. How do you translate genetics into languages that have no translation for it? What is the concepts behind it? Is it to do with family? Is it to do with connections between us? Is it to do with ancestry, heritage? Is it to do with police and crime? You know, just trying to unpick what makes sense in lay language has been fascinating. Another, um, I suppose, learning point for me is, you know, when we're talking with public audiences, um, there's a certain framing that we give our language. So we're not talking in very formal scientific Queen's English. You know, we're talking in lay colloquial language and how that translates into other languages as, as another translation step. So often in the, in, the, in the survey design and in the translation process, we had lots of conversations with different researchers around the world about what sort of translation do you want? And for uh, when we're thinking about gender and assigning gendered terms or pronouns to terms that don't have a gender attached to them already, do we make data masculine? Do we make data feminine? Um, how does that mix with genomic data where genomic might be framed as feminine, mixed with data that's mass, you know, that all sorts of sort of technical translation issues came up. So that's been an absolute joy for me is to learn so much. Um, and also we've got so much, we've got such a lovely collaborative group now. Um, I'm really enjoying connecting and I want to do that more and to, to hear from our collaborators as to how they're making sense of the data in their own settings. Um, because for us in Cambridge, we can say that there are differences in attitudes between countries, but it's somewhat arrogant of us to try and explain why there are differences. Um, and I, you know, this is where we need our collaborators to, to help explain the context in their local countries as to how genomics is playing out there. So it's different from how it is for us. Thanks. We've got um, one more question has come in as well. Um, so about so it's it's a question around um, the yeah the gap of scientific knowledge around around DNA and um, this being something that increases with age. Um, so particularly in particularly in India, the question relates to and the question is that how do you yeah how do you look forward in in creating awareness around DNA and genomics and um, yeah. And how in this project are we seeking to kind of lessen this information asymmetry? Well, um, I guess this project is about, um, is the starting point, isn't it, in, in terms of gathering attitudes towards a concept that we now know people really don't understand. So then the next phase is figuring out how to socialize, socialize this for different audiences. And I certainly have some ideas about how one might do that. Um, and, you know, it's really up to, uh different jurisdictions doing this for their communities you know that's not up for us in in cambridge to make decisions about how this should be socialized in india that's up for local people in india to decide what makes most sense but as a broad principle um i'm moving so much more and more away from education being the method and teaching of the science being the method I don't feel I think we've got enough evidence to show that that's really not working we've had education programs and engagement programs that have focused on the science and delivering the science for so many years now and for some of course that's going to work but you have to be engaged enough already to be able to access them um, so I think it's really time to be very creative with this and look to other places that are doing this well. So whether that's filmmakers, whether that's particular directors who um, are speaking to certain community groups really well, and the, you know, this proliferation of you know, viral ideas are being spread because they're connecting. And I, I could almost guarantee that the reason things spread virally 
or films work is because there's an emotional resonance in there. Um, so why is it that a shower gel on YouTube would have 60 million hits um, for Dove shower gel? You know, it's got 60 million hits because it's not because people care about shower gel, it's because they care about the emotional story that's in that little clip. It's about um, some emotional resonance. And I think that will be the way that we cut through. And I also don't feel that we are experts in that. That's where we need to draw on other expertise and collaborate and be very multidisciplinary in bringing together the storytellers, um, the creatives, the people who've been thinking about this deeply for their whole careers to help us with this. I think starting with the science and starting with our experience is probably not the way to do this. Well, um, so the questions are yeah, still coming in and um, we've probably got time for a couple more, I think. Um, I mean, so one is at the end of that, that, that first question that, that I, just, um, I just read out is this question about, are we, do you think we're looking towards a kind of common global DNA regulatory framework? Do you think that there's a, a value in a kind of common global um, <laughs> approach? Well, I think I think that would be more of a question for organisations like the Global Alliance for Genomics and Health, because from my understanding, um, you know, the mission and the strategy there is to um, is to create consistent, globally acceptable frameworks for data sharing and to free up data and to enable data sharing and to sort of set within a human rights framework, um, following the basic principle that we all have a right to benefit from science, um, enabling responsible data sharing. So that's that would be a question for them. In terms of um, a single way of messaging around DNA genetics and genomics, I think that might be a little ambitious. Um, you know, from, from what we know already is that people around the world think about this in different ways. And so for, for specific targeted campaigns, it's probably most useful to tailor make them to specific audiences. So I think there, there are various broad principles that we might agree, and they, they might be that DNA genetics and genomics is not widely understood. You know, that's a sort of <laughs> starting point. And let's move towards, you know, in particular communities, what is understood about this. So this is making me think about Jerome's work in Ghana, you know, with the Gar Ghanaian public. Um, and if you're translating uh, DNA into Twi and Ua, it translates as a gift from the family. So if you're then talking about a gift from the family being shared around, that's the family gift that's being shared. Um, so that has a very different connotation from if you're talking about just hard data being shared. And the other thing we know is that people, certainly through the Your DNA, Your Say study, is that we've shown that people don't make a dis distinction between different types of data. So, you know, if we think about banking data, online photographs, you know, genomic data, health data, it's all data um, and should be equally protected. So there's nothing special about genomic data that should have extra protections or anything. And then, yeah, so then there's, um, there's there's one more comment as well about about the um, kind of relationship between genetics, I suppose, and gene genealogy or understandings of genetics and genealogy. And do you think that that, I mean, um, yeah, so there isn't a specific question, but it's a kind of interesting is like whether you think that that is a, a valuable um, way into into talking to people about um, you know, so it was so we're looking at the way the, the way kind of genealogy in, in and conversations in yeah, absolutely yeah. the conversations in um so if your exposure to genetics is through ancestry testing and that's where you're familiar with it then yes that's the conversation in that you can then turn into you can then steer towards health and disease or whatever um but if your your target audience has only ever heard of DNA testing in relation to non-paternity, for example, and we know there are some groups that have really only heard of it in relation to that, then that's your way in. Or if, if there are certain groups that have only heard about this in relation to the, you know, the national database and crime and identifying bodies, then that's your way in, you know, because it's going it, to, you know, you're, you're basically looking for, for where your connection is, where are people up to speed, what, what's their their understanding, how are they coming to this conversation? And then you're using that to, to build on it. Um, and I'm not saying that you then do a whole public engagement campaign around 
um, police crime and non-paternity, you wouldn't. But this is when you, you when you're thinking about engaging with a specific group, you, you you have to start by listening. You don't start by telling. You have to get you know this this is you know trying to move away from the deficit model. Your starting point is well, where what's the level playing field? Where where are we all up to with this? And then we build on that. Um, and it may well be that it takes you off in all sorts of different directions before you get to your agenda, but you, that's that's the way it goes. That's the way it has to be because, you know, or the alternative is that people just disengage and move on. So how do we catch their imagination? How do we keep them connected enough to, to explain what we're actually talking about? Thank you, Anna. I think we're coming up to the hour. Thanks so much for the talk again and for the questions. Oh, it's, it's, it's been so lovely, isn't it? I really and uh, really pleased with it. I haven't been able to read everything because there's quite a lot of, lot, lot of text in there, but hopefully everybody's um, found it a helpful kind of background to what we're doing and why and what our motivation is for this. Um, so I think we'll end there. We'll put uh, on our website um, details of when our next seminars are going to be. And I'm so excited to hear from our collaborators moving forward. Our next seminar is actually going to be Richard who will be um, presenting and um, so giving a bit more depth on some of the findings um, and some of the analysis and some of the incredible statistics that our statistician Kate has done for the project and the modeling. Oh, and Lauren's put it in the chat already. So 21st of July, 4 p.m. British summertime. So thank you everybody. And hopefully we'll see you around. Okay, bye.